Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us online for Henley & Partners Global Webcast on their recently launched USA Wealth Report 2024. Let's start first with some introductions. My name is Juliet Foster and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our panel of experts. They're here because they have a pretty big task to unpack. Let me give you an idea of what we're going to talk about. They will be understanding or explaining, I should say, why there is such an increase in US Americans who are currently seeking alternative residence rights abroad or additional citizenship. It is a big subject, understandably. Let's meet our experts who will be with us over the next hour. First up, we've got Judy Gaust. Now, Judy is the Managing Director of Private Clients USA for Henley and Partners. Welcome, Judy. It's very good to see you. I'll give you a wave back. It's great to see you. Let's also extend the welcome to Mehdi Kadiri. Mehdi is the managing partner, head of Americas for Henley and Partners. It's very good to see you. Welcome. Thank you. Good to see you as well. Thank you very much. Peter Farino is director of tax services at Henley and Partners. Peter, a very good day to you. Hello. How are you? Very good. Thanks, Juliet. It's always nice to see you. Oh, that's such a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're going to be my BFF throughout this. I can sense it immediately with a compliment like that. Next up, we've got Mark Tepsich. Mark is the Executive Director of Family Office Design and Governance Strategies at UBS. Mark, hello. Juliet, thank you very it's much. It's an absolute uh, pleasure. Great, thank you so much. And finally, let's extend a welcome to Michael W. Sonnenfeld. Michael is the founder and chairman of Tiger 21. Hello. Good morning. Thank you. Well, good afternoon from over here in London. But look, it's great to see everybody. And we appreciate the fact that you've taken the time out of your busy schedules to join us. Now, there's a lot of ground to cover. But what we're going to do is start with Mehdi, because Mehdi is going to give us a short but very detailed overview of the key takeouts from the USA Wealth Report, which I referenced earlier. Just to give you more context to that, that report is the benchmark for private wealth research in the world's largest wealth market. So Mehdi, I'm going to hand things over to you. You have five minutes for your presentation, five minutes. Thank you, Juliet, for the warm introduction. I, I am excited to dive into the 2024 USA Wealth Report a collaboration between Henley and Partners and New World Wealth. This report gives us a detailed view of Americans' wealth from trends among wealthy individuals to city wealth patterns and insight into private wealth movement and investment trends. Here are the key findings. The USA holds an impressive 32% of the world's liquid investable wealth, totaling $67 trillion. Additionally, the USA is home to 37% of the world's millionaire with 5.5 million high net worth individuals. And over the past decade, high net worth individuals have increased by 62%, surpassing the global growth rate of 38%. Building on the previous key findings, uh, let's delve into some eye-opening statistics from the report. The USA ranks number one globally in terms of billionaires and centimillionaires, with nearly 10,000 centimillionaires and 788 billionaires dominating the world stage. Additionally, the USA ranks number six globally in wealth per capita with approximately 201,500 USD dollars. Transitioning to US top 10 wealthiest cities, New York City maintains its status as the wealthiest city in the US, bragging over 349,000 millionaires, 744 centimillionaires, and 60 billionaires. Other top cities include the Bay Area, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Houston. When it comes to expensive real estate in America, it's no surprise that once again, New York City leads the way. The average price for a prime apartment, 200 to 400 square meter um, in the city is 28,400 USD per square meter. Los Angeles follows closely with luxury properties averaging 17,800 USD per square meter. Other expensive area include Palm Beach, Miami Beach, and the Bay Area, where premium homes can cost as up to 15,500 per square meter. Now, let's examine growth trends. Take hub like Austin, 
uh, which appear number one here, have seen a remarkable 110% increase in millionaire population between 2013 and 2023. Similarly, cities like Scottsdale, Palm Beach, West Palm Beach have experienced notable growth in, the, in the, their high net worth individual residents. Now, this research supports what we're seeing at Henley & Partner, that there's dramatic interest among centimillionaires and billionaires from, from these cities who wants to learn more about alternative residency and citizenship. Now, a common question we often get asked is, what are the top five most popular residency by investment and citizenship by investment program for Americans? This is a, a snapshot of some of the most popular investment migration program available. But what's interesting to note from a demand perspective for Americans, it's almost a 50-50 split between Caribbean option and European program. The top Caribbean option in terms of inquiries are, and, and application are St. Kitts and Nevis, followed by Antigua and Barbuda, and then Grenada. On the European side, the top programs are Malta and Portugal, although we are seeing Spain becoming increasingly popular this year. Now, let's talk about how we collected this data. Our partner, New World Wealth, is the only independent firm that tracks wealth migration globally. They monitor over 150,000 wealthy individuals and focusing on those with over 30 million USD in company holding. These include company founders, executive, chairman, CEOs, president, and managing partners. New World Wealth primarily uses its database to analyze wealth distributions in cities. They verify city location using public sources and also consider data about prime property homes in each cities and area. We believe wealth is better measure of economic health than GDP for several reasons. GDP often goes to the government, counts items multiple times, um, ignores banking and stock market efficiency, overlooks property and stock market impacts, and, and changes slowly. In contrast, wealth figures provide a more accurate assessment of economic health. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present the wealth report, even with the limited time of five minutes. If you like to read the report in, in the entirety, I would encourage you to visit our Henley website where you can find a full US wealth report as well as several articles from renowned contributors who have shared their experience and expertise on US wealth management insight and trends. I hope you find it um, useful and insightful. Now passing on the baton to Juliet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mehdi, and it is gratefully received. That was an excellent presentation, so much ground covered. And that's good because it means there's a lot for us to discuss as we actually pursue many of the themes that you raise from that report, which is actually quite wide in its scope. But above all, we want you, our online audience, to be involved in this conversation. So indeed, if there are any questions or comments that you would like to put to the panel, you can do so using the Q&A function on Zoom. And I guarantee we will try to get through as many of those questions as we can at the end of the panel discussion. So my opening gambit to the panel is, are you ready to be part of this conversation? Ready. Fantastic. Absolutely. I'm glad. Uh, excellent. Well, I'm glad you answered first, Judy, because you'll be delighted to know that that opening question goes to you. Following on from that presentation, are people from the United States really interested in obtaining an alternative residence or citizenship? What are you hearing from your end? So if you had asked me that question four years ago, I would have had a very different answer. Henley's been in business for over 25 years, and until 2020, the majority of our clients came from emerging markets. They were people living in countries where they had weak passports, and it was difficult for them to travel to places like Europe without getting a visa. Or they lived in countries where they were concerned about political and economic stability, and they wanted to make sure that they had options for themselves and their children and grandchildren. And these motivations didn't really speak to people living in the United States until very recently. 
And we'll talk later, I'm sure, about some of the key drivers that have increased the interest. But the answer to your question is yes, um, there's been a surge of interest among Americans who are considering alternative residence and citizenship. And in the past four years, Henley has seen a 547% increase in inquiries coming from Americans um, who are seeking a second passport or an alternative residence abroad. Okay, so 547% increase. So you guys are very, very busy. But Mehdi, following on from that, what are those key drivers that Judy reference that are actually causing this surge in interest? Because one would imagine that it's it's a combination of so many factors. Sure. Th thanks a lot for for the question. In, indeed, there are a few, um, you know, several key drivers. Uh, first one, I call it uh, Plan B passport. So many Americans considered alternative residency or citizenship a Plan B passport to hedge against domestic risk providing protection from various events like political unrest, uh, civil war. Uh, we can remember the, the, the previous mask mandate, the vaccine mandate, and other potential uh, challenges. Uh, the second one, I call it, um, you know, a global event impact. You know, uh, the recent global event and conflict that, that we are witnessing, the, for example, the Israel-Palestine war, the, the Russia-Ukraine war, and, and other previous major disruption um, like the COVID-19 that we remember have prompted many wealthy individuals to seek additional safety and security option by acquiring alternative citizenship. Another driver um, is mobility. The, the COVID-19 pandemic is a great example, uh, which put into light the value of alternative residency and citizenship. So wealthy individuals were looking for option that allows them to travel freely, especially during time of crisis. Many of our clients were trying at, at, at the time of COVID-19 to beat the ban. At the peak of the pandemic, we, we've met numerous um, international travel ban in place. The, the US passport ranked on the Henley Passport Index, um, you know, dropped from 187 visa-free country to 61 country visa-free travel, uh, which um, almost was nearly on par with an Indian passport, for, for instance. Um, another driver is quality of life. Um, I think that's another important driver for our client. And aspects such as better climate, better health care, appealing retirement option, and overall well-being significantly influence their decision making. Uh, last but not the least, I call it, um, you know, a business and investment part, uh, opportunities, the, 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 um, the ease of doing business, right? So these investment migration programs create opportunities for individuals to open offshore bank accounts in different jurisdictions, open business venture, access to diverse market, and even for their future family generation, educational avenues for themselves and, and families. I mean, there's so much there, but I think it's also worth stressing, too, that these are ideas, aspirations that, that most people would want, particularly the quality of life in terms of where you're going to achieve it and also putting your family's needs first. But, Mark, you know, part of your job is understanding the needs of families. So given that, could you perhaps comment on what some of the key priorities are that you're seeing among high net worth families today? Presumably, there is an overlap with what you've heard from, um, from Medi. Yeah, thank you, Juliet. Yeah, of course, there's definitely an overlap uh, of what Medi sort of indicated. And anecdotally, you know, I've seen this over the last couple of years, and it comes down to one thing, it's optionality, right? And so within optionality, it's about, as Medi mentioned, safety and security, right? So we're looking around, you know, the world seems unstable. And so it's like, listen, if I can't be here, where else can I take my family to? What are my options? Um, I think that's a key driver. The other driver, I think, is just, again, it goes back to optionality. And it's like, I'd like to spend more time here in Europe uh, or wherever, because frankly, it's a lot of fun, right? And so I see those key drivers. Um, I see the fun aspect a little less, but I see the safety and security top of mind for a lot of these families that we engage with here. So, um, I, you know, I completely agree with what Mehdi uh, indicated earlier. And Peter, come into the conversation because look, 
you know, we've, we've been looking at the key factors that are actually pushing this, this interest in citizenship and, and residence by investment. They're, they're all very strong ideals. But at the same time, what are the tax considerations that Americans need to factor into their decision making? I think there's issue tax issues for everybody that moves, but there are specific ones for Americans. So I'll come on to I'll deal with that in two stages. I mean, residents and tax residents are two entirely different things. So when I, my colleagues can get you a residence to give you the right to go and live in another country, that doesn't automatically mean that you're going to go there. And it's only if you do physically choose to locate there that you could potentially become tax resident. And typically, that's driven by whether you spend uh, more than half of your days there, whether you have a available home there or not. And if you're a resident, you're taxable on your worldwide income. If you're not resident, you're only taxable on any income you generate in that country. Now, citizenship is entirely different. And the US is the only country that actually taxes people on citizenship. So a, you know, a German or a French person or you know, can leave France or Germany and stop being taxable there. If an American leaves the US, the US will still treat them as being taxable because they're a US citizen. And so the opportunities that you get and the ability to say, well, this country's got a low tax system or this country's got a high tax system isn't going to apply to Americans in the same way as it would apply to almost every other country. Now, there's a small thing there, like if Americans are working abroad full time, they have what's called a foreign earned income exclusion. So the first $126,500 of your income isn't taxed in the US if it's being taxed abroad. But usually that's because the income tax rates you pay in that country would probably be pretty similar anyway. Um, but for obviously the high net wealth people, that's going to be a drop in the ocean. But for US people, it's very, very different. Mm. And, and Michael, coming to the conversation, because I know that you founded an exclusive global community of ultra high net worth entrepreneurs, investors and indeed executives. So what I'd like you to do for me is to talk us through the, the top areas of interest for your members, specifically in the area of investment migration. What is it that they're raising in the conversations they're having with you? So <clears throat> we're uh, celebrating our 25th anniversary at Tiger 21 with 120 groups around the globe. And I mention that because we've been carrying on these conversations once a month with every member for 25 years. And at no time before 2016 was investment migration or, or getting a backup or a plan B uh, a discussion. And uh, while the conversation to date has identified four or five or six drivers as a practical matter in our groups, there's only one driver, political instability. People are concerned about the end of democracy. Uh, specifically, people uh, are concerned that if uh, Donald Trump is reelected, he said he will suspend certain uh, uh, norms that people believe are at the heart of our democracy. And for people who are afraid of that being persecuted uh, for whatever reason, uh, they're facing an unimaginable break in a 200 year tradition and wondering where they might feel safety. Uh, particularly uh, when you go overseas and you meet people who have come, sometimes those are tax, people looking for better business climate or tax situation. But when you're in the United States, I haven't heard a single conversation about seeking uh, to relocate or having a plan B for anything other than political instability, which obviously is a very, very deep concern given the political polarization we're all seeing. Hmm. That's really interesting as well, because in some respects, it, it echoes something which you said earlier, Mark, because Michael, you were talking there about political instability and people wanting to go somewhere where there is that security, they can feel they're living with somewhere where the democratic norms are upheld. And Mark, you were talking about security, which certainly from a Brit perspective, we tend to look at in terms of um, the apparatus to protect us on the streets, terrorism, pushing it back, etc. Um, but Mark, stay with me on this, because look, what I want you to do is to help me unpack the discussion around families in a bit more detail, because what is most important in fa how family governance is set up for the families themselves? And where do some of these actually go wrong? Because where it has gone wrong, you're the guy who has to pick up the pieces. Yeah, 
Uh, exactly. So, you know, engaging with a lot of families on their governance, right? Whether that's around the portfolio or around oftentimes their family business and families today, um, they're global, right? They're not solely relegated to one city forever, next generation, next generation. And so they become global. The issue that creates um, is, listen, you need to connect you need to communicate, you need to be transparent, and that's more challenging to do. And when you think about this, these global families were really the Zoom families before Zoom, before COVID, and so they had those challenges. And so I deal with families all the time, and they're focused on the structures, and that's great, okay, that's a priority. But let's talk about what's necessary for the relationships to thrive. Again, that's communication, that's being intentional about it, that's connecting, whether it's virtually or whether it's in person uh, once or, you know, several times a year. And so let's focus on the behaviors, right? Let's not solely focus on, hey, we got this committee and we're, and we're going to meet four times a year. Let's focus on being transparent and communicating. And from there, you know, it's still going to be a challenge, but it gets easier. So let's focus on the behaviors rather than merely, hey, we have, we have this committee and we've got governance. That's so far from the truth. Let me also ask you to extend that because I, I want you to contextualize it for me because look, given what you've said, why is family governance so important within the context of what we're seeing, that 85 trillion US dollar wealth transfer, it is gaining momentum. We got that sense of it from that presentation that Medi gave at the very beginning. Yeah, so, so the wealth transfer, you're looking at numbers, right? You're looking at 85 trillion, but what's really being transferred? What's really being transferred is relationships, right? And so that's trustees and beneficiaries, that's directors uh, and that's owners or shareholders. And so it's not really about just the numbers on a balance sheet. You're looking at new relationships being created and for people that really need to step up and be a part of those relationships, right? Uh, again, it goes back to relationships. So governance is essentially just relationships around a shared asset or a shared resource. And again, going back to the global rather than merely local, um, it's a reality for these families. And so as these numbers are being transferred, the relationships are being transferred. And so what are the behaviors? And so that's where governance can really step in and help. But again, it's merely the relationships that are that are at stake, not nearly, not necessarily a dollar amount or a committee. So let's focus on behaviors. And that's the real transfer going on right now, not just the numbers. The numbers mm -hmm. only reflect those relationships being transferred. Okay. And, and Judy, look, I don't expect you to, to, to name names. That would constitute a breach of confidentiality. But I know that you work one-on-one -on -one with your clients, particularly those seeking more information around investment migration. So in terms of the overview, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that people have around this topic? What is it that you're having to, or where is it that you're having to correct them? So I think there's probably three common misconceptions. Um, you know, when I tell my friends what I do, the first thing they ask me is, is this legal? Like you can get another passport? And the answer is yes, this is fully legal. Many countries around the world have programs that allow foreigners to obtain residence or citizenship in exchange for making an investment in the country. And the programs are not just of benefit to the person who's pursuing it. It's a really important strategy for these countries. Um, the money that they get from this foreign direct investment is critical to help improve the lives of their citizens, to pay down debts, to invest in infrastructure. Okay. I'd say please I have do two go more, on. Two more yeah, misconceptions. Do, do, do go on. Do go on. Um, then people say, well, if I get another citizenship, does that mean I have to renounce my US citizenship? And the answer is no. Um, the US allows dual citizenship. And in fact, we have clients that are getting a portfolio of options. So they might get one or two citizenships and a residence. So um, the US doesn't limit uh, these kinds of relationships. Um, there may be some other countries that don't allow for dual citizenship with a US passport, but the US is not prohibiting it. And then finally, I would say that um, touching upon what Peter spoke about, people think, oh my gosh, if I get another residence or citizenship, I'm gonna pay double taxes. 
And just to clarify what Peter said, just by becoming a citizen of a country, it does not mean that you are going to be taxed by that country. Just by becoming a resident in that country, it does not mean you're going to be taxed by that country. You have to become a tax resident. And I would say that for virtually all of the programs that we support, you'd have to live in that country for over six months a year, which in my experience and speaking to the majority of my clients, people really don't intend to leave the U.S. for that long. Um, they're really thinking, as Michael said, um, in, in this what if scenario and making sure that they have options. Yeah, I mean, what if is looming so large now as we approach November. But before we actually continue the conversation, just a reminder to you, our online audience, please do get involved in the conversation. If there are any questions or comments that you'd like to put to the panel, now is the opportunity to do that. And I guarantee we will try to get through as many of them as we can at the end of the discussion. All you have to do is use the Q&A function on the Zoom facility and we will deal with those questions at the end. But Michael, let me refer to your essay for the USA Wealth Report because you highlighted Singapore and Dubai as two global magnets for the ultra wealthy. Indeed, you mentioned how some Americans perhaps don't fully comprehend what you've described as the livability of these two zones. I mean, they are financial powerhouses. Can you unpack that for the audience, sure. especially those watching in the USA, the livability factor? Yeah, Mo most Americans take for granted the livability factors that uh, plagues many people in other parts of the world. And if you live in a part where there's rampant crime, and of course there's crime in America, but there are places where there's rampant crime, where the basic functioning of government is not strong. So the municipal systems, whether it's buses or water, don't function well, uh, where the rule of law is not honored. If you take all these factors, um, if you've made a decision to live outside the United States, or if you're coming from another place, Singapore and Dubai have become two extraordinary locations where people say it's the best place in Asia to bring up a family. Uh, obviously, people in Japan might uh, take issue with that. But when you're coming from uh, certain areas around Singapore or Dubai that have lots of tensions, um, the livability factor and the ability to bring kids up in a stable environment and to have a government. Singapore, as an example, pays the highest salaries to its government officials, I believe, of any government in the world. And as a result, they attract the best and brightest. And Singapore is known for being a model of efficiency. It's not a liberal democracy, as Americans know. It is a form of democracy, which is more restricted, but even the Americans that live in Singapore say that the form of government is less important than all of the other attributes that they find. And there's extraordinary pleasure at uh, living in uh, Singapore uh, and bring children up there. Mm. Uh, following on from that, Mehdi, what I'd like you to do is to elaborate on some of the most sought after jurisdictions among wealthy Americans and the factors that are contributing to their popularity, because clearly we, we've heard about the experience of Singapore and Dubai. There are a few myths which need to be disentangled there. But in terms of other areas that you've noticed, what, what is it that's emerging in terms of popularity? Thank you very much for your question. I touched on this topic earlier in the presentation. And what we are observing from a U.S. demand perspective is that wealthy Americans are acquiring multiple citizenship in various parts of the world. And I referred um, to this concept as domicile diversification. As an example, a classic combo we often come across would be typically clients um, you know, involved into obtaining a, a Caribbean citizenship by investment program, and in parallel, a European a citizenship by investment program as well. Um, the Caribbean program, uh, offers citizenship, the, the right to settle in the country, a, a passport with a, a relatively very quick processing time. We are talking about three to six month processing time, along with other privileges, such as the visa free travel benefit to Europe, as an example. And I think it's important to also quickly touch on aff affordability, um, the affordability aspect uh, as, as from a cost perspective, uh, uh, you know, the Caribbean options are quite cost effective. 
option for many wealthy clients as some of these programs, you know, are starting at a 100,000 USD uh, uh, price point. And in, in parallel to the Caribbean option, our client pursue European residency and citizenship through investment program like Malta, for example, um, gaining access to the freedom of movement, but mainly the right to settlement in multiple jurisdictions within the EU. So just, just a, a quick note on that, as an American a citizen, you, you have the, the right to visa-free travel in, within the European Union up to 90 days in every 180-day cycle, uh, but you don't have the right to settle. And this flexibility allows our wealthy client to choose any European Union country for relocation if they choose to, which is a, a significant advantage for many uh, Americans. And then um, another trend we're seeing is for the ultra wealthy, diversification extends to more than just two programs, but also to Australia, New Zealand, some non-European Union, European program, and even um, African citizenship by investment country. Um, just a quick note that what we're seeing as a trend is that the supply of this program uh, are actually increasing um, over time. Mm. And, and, and let's let's bring you into the conversation, Peter. Again, you're, you're going to give this sort of tax side of it, I guess. But I mean, which countries, uh, from your perspective, offer the most beneficial tax system for Americans who do want to become tax residents in their invested country? Where is the train going? Which direction? I think to go back to my previous point, yeah, accepting the fact that Americans, the US will always come along last and tax on a citizenship basis. What you're really looking for is somewhere that has lower tax rates than the US. And as long as they're lower, then you've got a lot of flexibility, but the ones with the absolute lowest ones give you the most flexibility of all. So you know, the UAE, for example, has no income tax, which is very handy. It has no capital gains tax. It has no inheritance tax, which is all very useful. Um, Singapore has low rates of tax as well. And if you want something a bit more off the wall, Italy and Greece, for example, they have a maximum tax, which I think is a fantastic idea because all you have to do is you pay 100,000 euros a year and that's all the tax you need to pay. Now, if you're only making 100,000 a year, that's an awful option. But once you're making more than 300, 400, 500,000 dollars a year, you know, the rate goes down, I can't do the math in my head, 30, 40, 20, 10%, and then suddenly, it becomes very attractive. It also makes the administration very easy. It makes the paperwork very easy. And so when you're claiming the foreign tax credits in your US tax return, you're not creating yourself an administrative nightmare either. So I think you put all of those things together and it really depends what you want. I mean, uh, people come to us and sometimes they're worried about selling their business and capital gains tax. Sometimes they're worried about passing assets to their family and you're looking at inheritance tax. Sometimes they're using trusts and some countries recognize trusts and some don't. So there's no one size fits all and never is. But as long, you know, for US um, taxpayers, as long as the tax rate is below the US rate, then it's not going to cost you too much money. And that opens up a world of possibilities to people. Mm, starting point, talk to the experts at Henley, they can guide you. But, but Mehdi, let me take it back to you, because look, what are the trends that you're seeing emerging in the investment migration world, particularly if we, we view it from a US outbound perspective? Thank you very much. Uh, one of the notable trends we are seeing is that wealthy Americans are no longer, um, as I echo the, the previous question, they, they are no longer limiting themselves to just one alternative residency or citizenship program. Instead, they are increasingly opting for a minimum of two program plus in parallel. And typically this include a Caribbean uh, citizenship play, um, a European citizenship play and, and some other um, you know, jurisdiction all over the world. And for the ultra wealthy segment, diversification is key. Uh, and they are strategically engaging in multiple citizenship by investment program globally. And this approach allows them to have exposure in different regions, such as you know, the Americas, um, Europe, Southeast Asia. Uh, and by diversifying their citizenship and residency portfolio, they gain access to a, a broader range of benefit, you know, including enhanced mobility, business opportunities, um, a lifestyle option across diverse 
diverse geographical areas. And Michael, look, where do you see the opportunities for the, the ultra wealthy globally? Because the world has opened up. There are quite a few contradictions because there are sometimes it feels like a much smaller place, but there are some great hotspots which perhaps um, were once upon a time neglected, but they're coming into their own. Well, you know, we've been talking about different reasons for um, changing your residency and uh, benefits that you would get. Um, our group is mostly an investment group. It's an, a group of people who are successful entrepreneurs and, and they're comparing notes. So, um, you know, all the places that have been mentioned, we have many members talking about the Caribbean, obviously Singapore and Dubai. Uh, New Zealand was the number one place for a while, but that's harder to get into. Many members looking at Portugal. Uh, but I think from an investment point of view, we live in global markets, so it doesn't matter where you physically are, your portfolio might look much the same. And even people in the United States who want international exposure find that if they invest in the S&P, a substantial portion of the S&P is international exposure. Uh, the one thing that I would note is that uh, in the last five years, uh, the role that China once played has now been surpassed by India. So that if you look at particularly our European members and say, uh, what's changed? Uh, the interest in China has withered and uh, the interest in India is exploding. Uh, you can obviously get closer to India in Singapore and Dubai, but you can invest in India from wherever you may wanna, wanna go. Um, in terms of just general allocation, um, across the globe, our members, uh, private equity is the big story. And uh, why that's such a big story is a decade ago, private equity would have been 10% of our members' assets. Today, it's 28 or 29%, the most extraordinary shift in recorded financial history of ultra net worth people getting involved in private equity. And uh, when you're involved in private equity, you're involved directly in businesses. And that's another reason to think about locating closer to those mm. businesses uh, where the situation uh, warrants it. Yeah, and I, I love the thinking there as well, the geography that you're talking there about Singapore and actually accessing it if you have interests over in India. And of course, India, the prognosis going forward is very, very optimistic. And I would concur with you, certainly from what I've been hearing from geopoliticists about that race between India and China. But Judy, I want to close out with you before we actually take some questions from our audience. But look, you know, we're, we're talking about these different schemes, but do many of your clients genuinely intend to leave the United States? Because on the one hand, there is the politics, there's the economics, but can you really push aside the lure of home, what you have grown up with, what is all too familiar, the possibility of leaving that behind? That's a very good question. And the reality is that it's an extremely small percentage of our clients, less than 2% that are obtaining an alternative citizenship because they intend to renounce. Um, I do have clients that plan to spend some significant time in another part of the world. So I could hear from a wealth manager that says they have a client that's planning for their retirement. They want to spend some significant time in Europe. They don't want to be limited to the 9180 days. And so there's a strategy there to either get them a residence if there's a particular country that they know they want to spend extensive time in, or even an EU passport, as Mehdi spoke about, which gives you this incredible freedom of being able to live unlimited anywhere in the European Union, as well as in Switzerland. Um, I have some families with younger children that will start out the conversation saying they really want to give their children the opportunity to be global citizens. And they are thinking about maybe moving abroad for a year or two. Um, so I don't want to say it's no, no clients that are thinking about leaving, but the vast majority of the prospects that I speak with are pursuing investment migration as an insurance policy. And they want to remain in the United States, but they also realize there is some risk to having one mobility option. And in this age of uncertainty, they want to ensure that their families have options and opportunities for the future. And this is a tool to help them obtain okay. that. Okay, no, great answer to that. So thank you so much. Okay, so look, it's been a really interesting discussion. My question to the panel is, are you ready to take audience questions? This is when we actually take a deep breath and we steal ourselves. Are we ready? Ready. 
I think we're ready. That's fantastic. And a reminder as well to you, our online audience, that if you want to get involved in the conversation with any questions or comments, then you know what to do. You can use the Q&A facility on Zoom, and some of you have indeed been doing that. So the rule of thumb is I'm going to put the question out there and whoever answers it, answers it. But please, everybody do get involved. So first question here, are you seeing a good level of interest in the Portuguese gold and visa via investment funds since it was stopped for real estate investments? Now, you guys are experts on this, but certainly in some of the conversations I've had with members of the Henley team, they have again said that Portugal is another one of those countries that has really caught the eye of people. So who would like to tackle that question about the golden visa via investment funds? Judy, thank you so much. I can see that just because I'm talking to clients all the time. And um, (laughs) I can tell you that I'm still speaking with a lot of clients about Portugal, just for those in the audience that aren't aware of what the question is referring to. um, You know, each investment program is going to have a financial investment you need to make to qualify. And for a long time, people were able to qualify for the Portugal Golden Visa via real estate routes. Up until 2022, you could actually purchase residential real estate. And then there were some changes that said uh, that limited the ability to do that. But there were um, investment funds that allowed you to, to invest in the hotel property. So essentially still a real estate investment. Uh, But due to political pressure because of rising housing costs in Portugal, the government put an end to the ability to obtain the golden visa by any avenue or investment related to real estate. But there are two very, very good turnkey routes that you can take to still get the Portugal golden visa. And I actually think a lot of people aren't aware of that and they think the program's actually closed. So it's a great opportunity to just um, briefly describe that. One is you can make a non-refundable contribution of 250,000 euros into an arts or cultural organization. They are approved organizations like museums, music, um, film related uh, entities, um, and that will qualify you for the golden visa. The other option is you can invest 500,000 in an approved uh, private equity or venture capital fund. So again, like people are diversifying their assets just because they don't necessarily wanna hold all their money in US dollars. So this is another strategy that I see, you know, people say, well, I'll." invest 500,000 euros in in one of these funds. Um, And at the same time, I'll qualify to get the Portugal Golden Visa. One of the reasons why Portugal is so popular is that although it's slow, it does have a reasonable path to an EU passport, which we spoke about earlier, is incredibly valuable. It gives you a ton of freedom. Once you ultimately get that Portugal passport, you are in fact able to live anywhere in the European Union or in Switzerland. So I would say that yes, people are still very interested in Portugal and they are pursuing these other options in order to qualify. Okay, would anybody else like to add to that from the panel about Portugal, your experience of it, all the conversations that you're having with your clients? No? Ah, Medi, please go for it. Really quickly, thank you, GD. Just to add to that, uh, I mean, it's true that the demand decreased when, when the government closed the real estate option. However, we've seen a, a spike in demand the past two months, and that was linked to, first of all, the good job uh, by the Portuguese government in promoting more the program, but also um, to say that the, the Portugal Golden Visa from a Henley perspective and all the service provider is still open for business. So there was a bit of re-education that we had to do uh, with our audience. And, and now we've seen that Portugal is pretty back on track in terms of demand. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for that. I'm going to move on to another question. Again, please, panel members, do feel free to answer it. There's no rule of thumb here as to who takes it. Can someone transfer the funds on my behalf for my citizenship by investment? Who would like to tackle that one? I can see both Mehdi and Judy nodding. Would you like to have a go at that? Or Mark, would perhaps you like to get involved? Thank you. Um, so, so this one is a pretty straightforward uh, too. So a lot of citizenship by investment program gives the opportunity for a sponsorship application. So for example, um, a, a father can financially sponsor the application, the donation or the investment for his children. So yes, you can financially sponsor the application of um, a, a dependent or, or a friend or a family member. Okay, Judy, would you like to add to that? I just wanted to reiterate that. I mean, I have a lot of clients that don't have the capital that's required in order to pursue the program, but they can have a sponsor 
um, that would be able to provide the funds. Um, Henley, of course, would do proper due diligence on who that sponsor is, as we do with all of our clients, um, but provided that they um, had you know, legitimate assets to be able to put towards a program, they're able to help uh, a friend or a family member pursue it. Okay, Peter, is there a tax implication on that at all? Um, it could well be, it depends where the money's coming from, where it's going to, if the country has a gift tax implication, if it has an inheritance tax, um, almost certainly it's a tax question that would be unique between the two parties involved. But yes, it would be something that probably makes is very prudent to look at. Right, but certainly the advice to the person who, who sent that question, if that's the route that you do want to go to, then obviously talk to Henley, but also to have that, con that tax conversation with you, Peter, because the worst yeah. thing that could happen is if you get stung and you're many pennies lighter. Yeah, because also the investment has to be an investment in most countries, in many countries, you can't borrow to make the investment. It's got to be, you know, money. So whether there's a, a transfer, whether the person has to gift you the money or whether they can lend it to you or, you know, that, that's where it gets really messy. It's going to be country by country where you're going to, but also where the sponsor's based and where the person is coming from. So, and particularly for US person, obviously we get into things like, you know, gift tax, et cetera. So yes, it's, um, oh, I'm looking forward to that. So please bring me that question, that would be fun. <laughs> I think you're gonna get lots of questions along those lines. Let me draw the panel's attention to a news announcement recently, and it was um, came out of the Caribbean. And again, the Caribbean was referenced earlier in our conversation because over the weekend, we had the Prime Ministers of Antigua and Barbuda, the Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, and St. Kivis and Nets, they signed a landmark memorandum of understanding, an MOU, strengthening their SIPs and also enhancing the integrity of their citizenship by investment programs. Makes sense, I guess, because, you know, you, you, I think, Michael, you were talking about um, that foreign direct investment. So, again, this is one way of bringing it in. And in terms of geography, yes, the Caribbean, its relationship to the United States, if you, if you want to have the feet in both camps, again, a great place to go. Uh, it certainly is. Uh, I happen to be quite familiar with all those waters. I sail between all the islands that you uh, mentioned. And uh, certainly uh, uh, St. Kitts and uh, Nevis and uh, Antigua and Barbuda are among the most popular in the Caribbean areas. Uh, it's, you know, it enhances if it, they're places that you want to be anyway. It just adds to uh, the security that it provides because um, some of these, uh, some of the motivations, as I mentioned, are uh, dependent on how people view the election coming up. And they have this view that the day after the election, uh, they're uh, gonna use their plan B. Well, you wanna have a passport to a place that you'd like to spend time in. And uh, certainly, um, you know, a simple thing like a direct flight. One of the things about uh, Singapore and Dubai is their transportation hubs. Antigua is a pretty good transportation hub. It has direct flights from the US and Europe, uh, and that might be an important consideration. Mm. I mean, certainly during COVID-19 as well, I, I know I, I, might, I, I have a bias here because I, I am partly Barbadian, but certainly we actually saw a number of islands and governments actually using the crisis to, for want of a better term, reinvent themselves because they have to pivot their economies away from that tourism dependence. And they were offering all sorts of incentives for people. And understandably, people were actually taking that too. For sure. OK, let's move on to some more questions here. Can you tell us more about your citizenship by descent services slash options? Again, I'm going to throw that out to the panel. And if anybody wants to respond to an answer, then please do feel free to go ahead. Who would like to take that question? Um, I can jump in. Um, so this is a new um, service that Henley is offering because there are so many people that live in the United States that come from other countries. And although many of our clients obtain citizenship by investment, if you are able to qualify by descent, meaning your direct ancestors came from a country and that country permits you to gain citizenship because of that path, then we are also able to support you. Um, I personally am actually um, obtaining German citizenship. Um, Germany and Austria have laws that were introduced within the last five years for families who fled due to Nazi persecution, that they are guaranteed citizenship for themselves and for all future generations. And um, so I, I'm pursuing it through Germany, but it's um, an incredible 
freedom that I will be able to give to my children and to future generations so that they could attend school or work in other parts of Europe um, because of our family history. So it is another route. Um, not everyone is fortunate to be able to qualify, but we always talk about that in our conversations with our clients. And if there is a possibility, then we are able to support them. Yeah, but Judy, how, how, you, you sorry, you please do, do go for it. Do, do go for it. Sorry, I interrupted. I do beg your pardon. No, I just wanted to say that um, the program that you're talking to, I also have a German passport, as do my four children, but it was not extended to my wife. And as a result, mm -hmm. uh, we'll look to one of the programs that you're talking about, whether it's Portugal or Antigua, for her to have a, 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 a non-US passport. Uh, but the interesting thing is, um, one advantage that we didn't even talk about is my children can work in Europe without a work visa. And for yes. American kids, that's a fantastic uh, flexibility. My son uh, uh, was in Amsterdam last year working uh, as di directly as a result of uh, having a German passport. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Hmm. Uh, when we talk about dissent, how, how far back are we allowed to go on this? It's really going to depend on the country. Um, so. It's not a, a flat answer. As I said, for this German and Austria route, it's for all future generations. Um, but then there are other countries that will say it has to be only a grandparent or it could be two generations. So we have experts that are able to evaluate each person's circumstance and let them know whether they would have a viable case. Okay, let's move on now to another question. How can investment migration help protect intergenerational wealth. Now, Mark, how would you feel about tackling that? Because I think this was something which you referenced in an earlier part of your interview. Yeah, I mean, I, again, it's about optionality, right? And so, you know, for a lot of families out there that I see that are interested in these options, you know, these stories and their family are alive and well, right? Having fle fled Europe, they're looking at it as a hedge, as an, as options for safety and security. And as Michael just mentioned, I mean, his his uh, son worked in Amsterdam, right? So, I mean, it, it gives optionality in a lot of different ways, um, but it goes back to diversification, right? It's a core tenet of uh, being a good and prudent investor. Um, and so this is just another way to gain diversification. Okay. Would anyone else like to add to that at all before we take a few more questions in the time available? No? Okay, then. Can you please elaborate on the tax implications of renouncing U.S. citizenship? I have a uh, feeling I know who can answer that one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I can elaborate generally. You, I'm not U.S. tax qualified. I have to qualify, as I said that at the beginning, because it gets incredibly messy. But generally, giving up residence in other countries is, you know, can be relatively easy. Obviously, US giving up citizenship from a tax perspective, it can be a little bit more difficult than that. There's effectively, you, if you've got lots of gains and you've got lots of in, you know, money that hasn't yet been taxed, they will effectively treat you as selling everything on the day before you go and realizing all the gains and potentially being taxed on, in the worst case scenario. So, um, so you do have to be very careful. It's not something that you would do without deep thought, and without some deep calculations. And also there are broader you know, implications of once you've given up the US citizenship, how easy it is to go backwards and forwards. But, um, but yes, there are potentially large consequences to certain categories of people. But if you don't have all those mega gains, then it may not be a great thing. It also applies if you've got a green card and you're giving that up potentially as well. So you do have to be careful. If once you're a US taxpayer, you, know, you can check out, but you can't leave as I believe they say, yeah. I mean, it, it probably does sound a bit drastic to give up citizenship. And again, I, I don't want anybody to name names here, so please, because there is client confidentiality. But what happens if a client raises that in their consultations, either with you, Michael, or Judy, or Medi? I mean, given the tax implications, how can you yeah. talk them around from that? Because it, it is rather drastic. Well, we work really closely with some of the top tax attorneys uh, that specialize in expatriation planning. And so if a client ever raises that they're considering renouncing, we immediately would you know, involve them in the conversation to consult specifically with the client so that they understood what 
ramifications and costs are involved in them pursuing that path. Mehdi, would you like to add anything to that? Um, no, I mean, what I would add is um, not only do we have the network of um, tax advisors, um, you know, with all the top um, firms in the world, but we do now have also um, an, an internal expert, Peter, who is here, who can also navigate those conversations with our clients. Right, but it does sound to me as if, as if the general advice is OK, but think about it very, very carefully, because uh, as you said, Peter, you can check out. But if you change your mind, it's very difficult to check back in. OK, so we've got time for one more question. How much, if any, privacy is provided under the citizenship by investment programmes? I imagine it would differ by country. Sure. A fair point, because yeah. you, know, you can't really have universal harmonization here, can you? I, I can touch on that. So, so each government have um, a, a form of citizenship by investment unit, and um, the, the, so 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 under the different citizenship by investment unit, while there are varying degrees of due diligence and and privacy provided, uh, depending on the country, applicants should be prepared to be very transparent and share comprehensive uh, information with uh, the different governments and. Transparency and for off due diligence are typically required, um, you know, emphasizing the importance of understanding and complying with each program's privacy uh, policy and, and requirement. Also, there is a, a direct link with the reputation of those programs and the quality of the due diligence that, that they, 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 they do. They, they want to attract top quality individuals and, and, and professionals to their countries. So they have to get it right. They can't slouch right. on this because otherwise you could actually alienate the very people that you need to bring in. Would anyone else like to add to this before I close out our discussion? I just want to follow up on one thing that has to do with the conversations that go on within Tiger 21, admittedly a subset, but precisely the subset that Mehdi talked about statistically of people from 20 million in net worth to a billion dollars in net worth, which is sort of the sweet spot. Out of 100 people who talk about a visa, only one would talk about it for tax savings, and 99 would talk about it as a backup plan. So renouncing US citizenship is really limited to people who are quite obsessed with tax savings for whatever reason. And uh, that's a much more complicated activity. And obviously, once you do that, you're freed from US taxes. But 99% of the conversations are focused on uh, having a, a safe exit option in case uh, the political situation devolves to the people's worst fears. So mm -hmm. the tax complications, it's a little like the question of how many people have left New York and moved to Florida because of the salt talks. And it turns out it's not quite clear. There are many people who've done that, but in the end, it's not as big as uh, everybody talks about. People are less concerned about taxes than safety. Obviously, some people are very concerned about taxes, but others are really concerned about the fabric of life and safety in a uh, uh, government run amok. Mm, absolutely. I mean, obviously, you, you guys are a more expert at it than me, but certainly those are the vibes which I've been hearing from people in your field. And it, it is that quality of life aspect. And also, if you have children, giving them the experience of the world, which is why having an EU passport is most coveted. I don't have an EU passport, I hasten to add, but there you go. That's a conversation for another day, along with millions of other Brits in this situation. But thank you, panel, because there we must leave it. It's been a really fascinating discussion, and I'm so grateful for the time that you've put aside to be part of that conversation. And I'd also like to extend my thank you to our global webcast audience for taking part in this. Some great questions. And again, if you have any further queries, don't forget that you can speak to Henley and Partners. There are experts on hand and they will be more than happy to work with you to make sure that you make the right decision. So let me extend my thanks to everybody involved in this, those behind the scenes as well, bringing us all together. And also for you, Mehdi, for taking us through that USA Wealth Report. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation at the beginning. We appreciate your interest and engagement. And from London, I wish you a great day, stay safe, and I will see you again in the not too distant future. Take care.